Hi guys, it's Sandy Allock here with a Copic video for you today. And I'm kind of excited because Copic asked me to join their color challenge this month. They've been doing these each month. They give you three colors and say, go make something with them. And they sent me the three markers. So I am going to be doing some uh, springtime bokeh. And I will tell you a little bit more about that as we go because I did do some research. I've marked off my paper and then put some masking tape around the outside so that I can have a nice clean edge. Put my marker into my air gun, which is hooked to my compressor. I press the little button and color comes out. And I wanted some light color in the background and then my image is going to be on top. So I am spraying circles basically, leaving a little bit of what we call or what we're used to calling bokeh, bokeh, bo bokeh. Lots of different ways to say it. What I researched is that bokeh means blur in Japanese, and it's the blurry shapes. It's not the shapes themselves, but it's the fact that there's something blurry behind the image. And the little shapes are not what's called bokeh. It's also pronounced bokeh, and the way that I saw it explained it is it's not bokeh like U-H, it's bokeh like in Kentucky without the Kentucky, so it's bokeh in that kind of a way. So there you go, a little bouquet education. But I am using a second color now to add a little more depth to my really soft background. And I tested this out a couple times. The darkest color in this trio didn't work so well in this background, so I'm saving it for just a few choice spots on the image that's going to be in the front of it all. But this mid-tone color is the one that, that's going to give me just a little bit more depth in this background and get that sprayed on there and then I can start on coloring my image right on top and since I'm using the same colors it doesn't matter that it's right on top if you were drawing something red on top of a green background like this that would be a little more challenging but since it's all going to be the same type of colors then no big deal so I'm just drawing a branch I thought since it's springtime and I am so ready for spring I am tired of the snow. We had really late snow this year, and that has been a pain in the drain. So let's go for something springy. And I'm starting with the lightest of the three colors they gave me, and I'm creating my leaves. And I'm not completing every bit of the leaf. I'm not doing an actual outline around them because I want it to look more realistic. I don't want it to look like a drawing in that kind of a way. They did say that for the challenge, you can use black and white. So you could have drawn the shapes with a black pen, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be really soft and look very natural. So I am kind of sketching them in and putting some of the shadows around from the edge and figure out where I want some of the highlights and just letting them be whatever the background color is. And I'll add more richness to them as I go, but going in with the lightest color gives me the ability to just give it some shape and start to give it a little bit of dimension and to make sure each one of my branches kind of ties off to the same spot so I get some really nice structure to this particular branch that I'm doing. I also wanted some of the leaves to touch each other just so it didn't feel too rigid so that it's not super specific like, like it was a cutout or something, but that it feels very natural like the wind could be blowing and these leaves could be going different directions. And so I'm going to throw all of my leaves in here and finish it out to the outside edge. And I did do another one of these. I'll show it to you at the end of the video <laughs> that the footage just didn't work. And I did grasses in the same kind of way. And I did learn something from that that I didn't like, which was using the colorless blender to create some of that bokeh. Um, didn't look all that good. After the research that I did on this technique in photography, Photographers actually consider the shapes, if you get solid shapes and they become distracting because they become the image, that that's not as, as beautiful <laughs> as when it's just very natural and soft. So I'm going to leave it really soft on this one. This is the darkest color, the G17. And I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. I know the colors are on the screen, but that was a YG23 to start with. This is the dark G17. And I'm just going to go into a few of the darkest spots. And this is where I would have put some black if I were using black, but I want to keep it soft in those three greens. 
and see how much depth and realism I can get without actually having to resort to any kind of a black pen. So I'm just putting some along a few edges that are going to be deep in shadow, a little bit down some centers, some along the branch itself to just give myself a little bit of that pop. And then I'm jumping to my mid-tone, which is YG17. Notice they gave you, a for this particular color group, there was a YG23, a YG17, and a G17. So if you're one of those folks that thinks you have to always use YGs with YGs or Gs with Gs, you don't have to do that. You can use any color together. And that is the way art goes. Just because they're on a chart next to each other does not mean you have to use them exactly that way. Uh, which I also want to talk about a little bit. If you have not seen my hex chart, I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. It shows you the colors of the Copic Spectrum in visual order. And I will show you what that looks like. And there's also another option for you if you are somebody who wants to study more about color and you want to know why this is working. I'm using three colors and I'm getting some really interesting, beautiful dimension here. Then you can take the Copic Jumpstart class. And that might help you as well to understand color. And I will tell you more about that later on in this video as well. But I'm babbling because I don't really have a whole lot to explain other than I am creating negative spaces. I'm doing some negative coloring with this YG17 with my midtone color, leaving some of those veins as the color of the paper or the color that was underneath of it so that I get a little bit of detail in the leaves. But notice that they're not all perfectly outlined. They don't all have color around every single edge, letting some of them just kind of fall away so that they end up kind of soft. And then I went back to my light color again, just to add some in a few of the areas that didn't get any real marker touching. And I wanted to give them just a little tiny bit and, and just a, a little bit more definition in a few of the areas that seem like they might need a little bit of attention in the, the highlight spots. And then going back in with my mid-tone marker to create a little bit more strength to my branch because it started feeling a little bit weak. And then I decided that I was gonna give myself permission to use the colorless blender. <laughs> and I'm not using it for the bokeh. I am using it just for a little bit of dew. Since it's springtime, I thought it would be fun to have dew on my branch. And notice when you use your colorless blender, you may have noticed you get a little pool of color around the outside edge. It almost gives you a natural outline to that, that little bit of white dot, which is kind of cool. You can add a little bit more shading to it, which I will do in a few cases. But in a lot of this, just having those white dots on there is going to allow it to look like it's been outlined, even though it hasn't. So don't outline them first. Just put the the colorless blender on there. And then on a few of them, I'm just gonna add a mid-tone shadow underneath of them, just to add a little tiny bit of emphasis, and that's it. And here is the magical reveal. You pull off the masking tape, and there you go. So on the right is my one you just saw. On the left is the one that has the grasses, and I used the colorless blender to add those white dots, which I did not like nearly as much, so I'm glad I learned that one on one so that I didn't apply it to the other. Now here's the hex chart, and this is available on my blog. There's a link in the description down below. And notice, I'm gonna put these three colors that I used for this challenge. Notice they're not all right next to each other. Some people think that I made the chart so that you use consecutive colors to blend and you need a little bit distance between them. But what the hex chart does is allow you to see which colors are really similar to each other. So you would know not to use these three colors that are in a row because look how similar they are. And you also, when you get, get the hex chart, when you buy it, you get a PDF of not only the blank ones, so you can color it with your own markers, you get a colored one and the colored one is not going to represent really well when you print it because your printer does not look like Copic ink, but you can actually get an idea of which colors are identical to each other because there's a lot of colors that are pretty much the same and you don't need to buy them all. So it will save you a lot of time and energy in order to just go ahead and get 
the colors that you actually need. And since Y17 is my favorite color, I saved it for last in coloring <laughs> that hex chart. These are some things from the Copic Jumpstart class, a lot of different color charts that are available, and I do a lot about shading. There's a lot of color theory on there. If you're interested in learning more about that for your Copic markers, then there's a link for that in the doobly-doo as well. And that is it for today. Thank you to Copic for letting me join in on the color challenge. I hope you enjoyed my little creative piece for spring, and I will see you again next time in the next video that I put out and have a really awesome day. Go out and color something beautiful. See you later.